person responsible for this talk is Dr. Eddie Brogy, who's unable to be here, unfortunately. So, so you all can report back. So our patient is a, can you hear me? Okay, I can't hear myself, it's fine. All right, so this patient is a 79-year-old woman. She is a former smoker. And she has a history of bilateral breast carcinoma. Uh, diagnosed one year previously, she had had bilateral lumpectomies. And on the right side, she had an invasive lobular carcinoma. And in the left breast, she had an invasive ductal carcinoma. And now she presented with widely metastatic disease. Chest CT shows a right lower lobe mass, as well as bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, multiple bilateral lung nodules, and also multiple new brain lesions, and she also had bone lesions. So I received the pathology for both her uh, thoracic surgical pathology as well as her cytopathology. And so the EBUS FNA of the right level 11 lymph node showed a malignant population of cells, as you can see here. Uh, they are dispersed singly and have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and you can see uh, one cell shows a vacuole, which we saw, in a, in, which I was able to see in a variety of cells in this smear. The endobronchial biopsy showed a very similar uh, morphology, and in high power, you can see that the cells are dishesive, and they have that same abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and in some areas, you can see the nuclei are uh, more eccentrically located due to the presence of that cytoplasm. So what is your differential diagnosis based on the histology? Don't be shy. Metastatic breast carcinoma, yes, that was definitely in my differential diagnosis. What else could it be? Okay. I can't hear myself, and I also can't hear you, but that's fine. So the differential diagnosis was either a new lung primary or metastases from her prior breast carcinoma. And given the morphology, if it was a metastasis, it would make uh, the most sense that it would be a lobular carcinoma. There's other things we could talk about in the differential diagnosis, but for now, uh, we'll just leave it at these two things. Uh, so the um, IHC. Uh, of the endobronchial biopsy was positive for GCDFP15. I just thought it was interesting to see the low power view. You can see the respiratory epithelium is also staining with this, and they're benign, so that I thought was curious. Uh, the tumor was negative for ER and PR. HER2 is weakly positive, and there's some weak positivity with androgen receptor as well. So if this is a lobular carcinoma, it's unusual to have ER negativity. So I did the breast versus lung markers, and the tumor is negative for GATA3 and positive for, the breast, uh, uh, positive for the lung markers. I also looked at her prior breast carcinoma. Uh, we have digital imaging available here for uh, most of our tumors that are, that are recent cases, and so this case was scanned, and so it was very easy to pull up this image and see what her prior lobular carcinoma looked like. I thought in a side-by-side -side comparison that they look slightly different. Um, and uh, the prior breast carcinoma was positive for ER and PR, which is compatible with what you would expect for lobular carcinoma. Uh, but when I uh, showed Dr. Brogy the case, she really felt strongly about getting GATA3 and TTF1 on the prior tumor because she just wanted to make sure her original diagnosis was correct, which it was. It was GATA3 positive and TTF1 negative. So this case ended up being fairly straightforward. The diagnosis is non-small cell carcinoma favor adenocarcinoma. So even though this is a horse and not a zebra, I think there are several learning points that would be uh, practical to anyone's practice in cytopathology and general surgical pathology because this is a very common problem that we see. So the first point is that breast versus lung cancer is a very common clinical problem. They are both very common tumors, and they both metastasize to every organ. So everyone who practices surgical pathology or cytopathology is likely to encounter this differential. Uh, many patients with breast carcinoma develop a second primary cancer, and, tip and lung is a major site for a new primary. And this can, uh, there, it, there's an increased risk for a second primary cancer after radiation, and this is even increased more so in patients who smoke. The lung is a common metastatic site for breast carcinoma. 20 to 30 percent of patients with breast carcinoma will develop lung metastases. And I think it's important to remember that the metastases can be in the form of a solitary nodule or an endobronchial metastasis. So it can mimic a primary lung uh, carcinoma, like in this patient. 
if it had been, but it's not. So the next discussion point is morphologic mimics. So there's a lot of morphologic overlap between breast and lung carcinomas. So this is another uh, interesting case. It's a resection specimen uh, from the lung in a patient who is female. And based on the histology, I see a, a carcinoma with a acinar and cribriform pattern with some central necrosis. And to me, on H&E, it looks like it has some neuroendocrine features. So what's your differential diagnosis? Breast cancer. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so actually, we weren't aware of a prior breast carcinoma at the time, and so this was worked up for a primary uh, neuroendocrine tumor of the lung, and the neuroendocrine markers are positive, but the KI-67 was intriguing. We thought if it was an atypical carcinoid, this KI would be rather high, but for a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, it's actually kind of low. And so after some digging in the records, uh, Dr. Reckman found out that the patient did have a prior history of breast carcinoma carcinoma, and this tumor is positive for ERPR and GATA3. So the learning point is that metastatic breast carcinoma can look like neuroendocrine tumors. It can even stain with neuroendocrine markers. So whenever we see neuroendocrine tumors in the lung, we always think of breast in the back of our minds if things don't uh, fit. Now the third learning point is immunohistochemistry, and there's a lot to say about immunohistochemistry, so I'll try to keep it brief. So here's another case of a lung nodule in a patient who has a prior breast carcinoma. And based on this H&E morphology, it looks like a carcinoma. I can't say if it's lung or breast. It is positive for ER, and the patient does have a history of prior breast carcinoma. However, it is also positive for TTF1 and absent A. So the diagnosis in this case is lung adenocarcinoma, and the learning point is that lung adenocarcinomas can stain with ER. So this is a nice table that Dr. Reckman uses when she teaches the fellows about uh, markers. And this is a table showing lung versus breast carcinoma markers, specifically focusing on breast markers. And when I was looking into the literature for this talk, I saw a paper that Dr. Brogy was involved with where they looked at TMAs of lung adenocarcinomas and lung tumors that were breast metastases. So I added this column here based on her findings. And as you can see, ER can be positive in up to 20% of lung adenocarcinomas. PR tends not to be positive, so that can be helpful if the breast carcinoma is a PR positive positive tumor. Androgen receptor is generally not positive, and when it is, it's very weak or focal, like in the case that I showed you. GCDFP15 is the same. It's usually not positive, and if it is, it's weak or focal. Mammoglobin tends not to be positive in lung adenocarcinomas, so that can be helpful. However, as you all know, it's not very sensitive for breast carcinoma. And GATA3 was thought to be the new specific and very sensitive marker for breast carcinoma. In the setting of ER positive uh, breast carcinoma, it tends to be very specific, um, and it's, it's not as, as, I mean, sorry, it tends to be very sensitive, and it's not as sensitive in uh, triple negative tumors. It can stain a few uh, lung adenocarcinomas. It typically doesn't, but but it does stain a lot of other tumors, um, as you are all aware. So there are also pitfalls with TTF1. So here's a biopsy of a pleura uh, that was, came as a consult to Dr. Travis. And you can see we have an acinar morphology with cribriforming in a, some type of carcinoma. It looks like there's even some mucinous features. And this is TTF1 positive. But the patient had a history of prior metastatic, uh, prior ductal carcinoma, and so GATA3, ER, and PR were positive in this tumor, and the diagnosis was metastatic ductal carcinoma. I want you to note the clone that was used. It was SP141. This is not a very good clone for TTF1. And so that's the next message. Um, we will talk about clones in a minute. So lung adenocarcinomas, 80% uh, of them are positive for TTF1 and 80% are positive for NAPSIN-A. So they're both very specific markers for lung adenocarcinoma. Um, but the problem with TTF1 is some of the clones can stain other tumors, and breast would be one of them. NAPSIN-A is actually helpful in this differential because it generally does not stain breast carcinoma. So these are the clones of TTF1, and the clone is very important. So we use 8G7. G3-1, which is the specific clone for TTF1, and it's what 
the thoracic literature recommends. Uh, however, many labs use SPT24, and some labs are using this newer clone, SP141. And both of these clones have much lower specificity for lung uh, adenocarcinoma, and they tend to stain other, other types of cancers. Specifically, SP141 uh, has been found to stain up to 30% of mesotheliomas. So these two clones are not recommended, and the more specific clone is what we use here. So here's another example of a, a tumor that's not a lung tumor that's standing for uh, TTF1. This is the SPT24 clone. This is a colorectal carcinoma. And then you can see with our specific clone that it's negative. And there's a lot of uh, tumors that TTF1 can stain. Uh, colorectal carcinomas can be positive with the less specific clone. Uh, GBMs can be positive with the less specific clone. Uh, Endometrial carcinomas and GYN carcinomas can be positive with both clones, so this is a very important uh, pitfall to be aware of. We've seen some endometrial tumors that are TTF1 positive, even with our specific clone, and then breast carcinoma. So the last discussion point is other diagnostic considerations. Uh, so this is our case of lung adeno, and this is another case of something that kind of looks similar. Um, next to each other, they don't perfectly match, but what um, would be the other thing in the differential if I didn't know anything about the history or the IHC? I can't hear. This one's for Deepu. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Melanoma is definitely in the differential, absolutely. It's S100 negative. But I'm just going to, Dr. Travis always says, how smart are you? <laughs> so our case, uh, we, have, uh, we have new antibodies for uh, SMARC-A4 and SMARC-B1. Uh, uh, SMARC-A4 is, uh, the antibody that we use for is BRG1, and the antibody for SMARC-B1 is INI1. And in our case, it's retained. But in this uh, other case that I'm showing you, it's a, it's a mediastinal tumor, uh, which has fairly rhabdoid morphology on high power. It's a kind of a loose definition of rhabdoid, but, but that's the sort of morphology that we look for in these tumors. And this one is BRG1, shows loss of uh, BRG1 by immunohistochemistry, and also loss of BRM. So these are, uh, BRG1 is the protein for the SMARC-A4 gene, and BRM is the protein for the SMARC-A2 gene, and we have IHC for both that work very well. So these are proteins that are part of the uh, swift SNF complex. Uh, you probably have heard of INI1. Um, in the thorax, we're finding both INI1 loss tumors as well as uh, SMARC-A4 tumors, and, and more often we're seeing SMARC-A4 tumors. Um, so SMARC-A4 deficient tumors are defined by loss of SMARC-A4 at the protein level, which is BRG1, and these are seen in uh, all over, uh, in a wide spectrum of tumor types across the, uh, across subspecialties, both in carcinomas and sarcomas. Uh, I first, when I was learning about these, read a lot of papers by Dr. Saslo looking at small cell carcinoma of the ovary hypercalcemic type back when I was in Minnesota, um, and we know that a subset of poorly differentiated non-small cell lung carcinoma can be deficient for SMARC-A4. Uh, uh, these tumors in the thorax have a morphology that's very similar to INI1 deficient tumors. They're high grade, and they may or may not have rhabdoid features. The immunophenotype is very nonspecific. They, they can be positive for keratins. They can also get some SAL4 positivity and synaptophysin positivity, but they tend to be negative for um, rhabdoid markers as well as S100. So there are three key papers on SMARC-A4 deficient thoracic tumors, and these have been called sarcomas because the very first paper was put out by this French group in Nature Genetics, and this is a sarcoma group. Um, and then there was a following paper by a group in Japan, which one of our former fellows is part of, as well as uh, my paper from uh, my fellowship. So in these studies, these, the, 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 the terminology is SMARC-A4 deficient thoracic sarcoma based on the initial paper, and these are studies with small numbers of patients, but all with very similar findings. Notice that all of these studies have a predilection for tumors that are in the mediastinum and not so many tumors that are in the lung. Uh, the age range uh, is actually fairly broad. It was initially looked at in a younger age group, but it, it actually is a broader age range. And the key point is that their median survival is very, very short. Uh, some things that can be helpful, this French study found that SOX2 is helpful in identifying these tumors. And there's been some literature on SMARC tumors uh, 
whether they're carcinomas or sarcomas and CLOTIN4 being a carcinoma marker uh, for uh, using, it, using it in this differential, uh, the Japanese group found that a lot of their tumors were CLOTIN4 negative. Uh, one of the things is when they use the sarcoma terminology, the tumors tend to be deficient in both SMARC-A4 and SMARC-A2, and that's what we found in our study. And in this French study, that was the way, the way they defined these. So they had tumors that looked like these sarcomas, and they also had non-small cell carcinoma with SMARC-A4 deficiency. And one thing that they found be different between the two groups is that the non-small cell uh, lung carcinomas were SMARC-A4 deficient, but not deficient in A2 and that these sarcomas were deficient in both. So I just wanted to quickly show you what we've been working on here at Memorial. So when I started last November, Dr. Reckman and the thoracic research fellow Joe had been working on these tumors. And so this is uh, data from IMPACT. And so the way they're approaching it is they're looking at all of this NGS data. So these other studies were looking at histology and identifying tumors that way, where she was looking at this from the NGS perspective. And she found that 26% of our uh, lung carcinomas have mutations in this complex. And she's been able to identify nine that fit into the sarcoma type category and 47 that are more like carcinomas. And this is a purely lung study, so there's no mediastinal or pleura tumors in, in this database. And what she found is that in the uh, carcinoma like to, in the carcinomas, that they had mutations in STK11 and KRAS, which are both car, uh, mutations that you see with, with smoking. So we're currently coming to think that these carcinomas really are a poorly differentiated or undifferentiated component of a small cell, a non small cell lung carcinoma versus a, a different entity or another along the same spectrum, but a more undifferentiated sarcoma type. And so this is something we're currently working on, and there'll be more soon. So I'd like to acknowledge all the people who helped me with this, and thank you for your attention. Right.